You are listening to the Hiking Radio Network, where we talk the walk with shows by hikers, about hikers, for everybody. Mighty Blue on the Appalachian Trail, the ultimate midlife crisis. Join Steve and his guests every week as he staggers from Georgia to Maine. Hi, and thanks for coming back again for the 104th episode of Mighty Blue on the Appalachian Trail. We've had a bunch of great episodes recently, passing the 100 episode mark a few weeks back and powering into the second 100 episodes. Today, I think you're going to find we've got another great one. For me, the story of this year's Appalachian Trail has been covered in one of my other podcasts, Returning to Katahdin, where I followed Bruce Matson all the way from his preparations to the summit of Katahdin on September the 1st. I know, I'm biased, because the show really took a lot of my attention. However, for the majority of the hiking community, the story that grabbed many of us was the unlikely journey of a father, a mother, and six children named Dove, Eden, Seven, Memory, Philia, and memorably, Rainier. Ben and Cammy Crawford were mum and dad to this unlikely band, yet their vlog became required viewing in my home. All the time I kept thinking... They can't go on much further, surely not. Yet they did, and many of us cheered their progress towards Katahdin. I should say at the outset that there were some critics of the family, some people who felt that they were entitled and whiners, yet I do not share that view at all. Indeed, one of my friends and a big supporter of the show asked me not to post the episode on his Facebook page, so if I can remember which one it is, I won't. I really like to think that I respect all views, but there was something in this family that spoke to me on a parenting level, and apparently the family spoke to many supporters in the country, because they were offered a hospitality greater than anything I could have ever imagined. Look, I'm not going to go on here because the family can speak for themselves, but I hope you can listen to their story with an open mind, because I think there is something in it for the supporters and the critics. For the Outdoor Retailers Show segment, I've focused on a specific topic, which is the validity of some of the outlandish and apparently spurious claims made by some manufacturers of hiking gear. I speak with Dr. Jan Beringer of Hohenstein. Who on earth are Hohenstein, you may well be saying? Well, they're the company that test out those claims and apply science to them. As you're going to hear in the interview, I got more and more interested as we went along, and afterwards I even get them to point me in the direction of somebody at the show with real-world experience of these claims and the validity of scientific testing. Confused? Well, you won't be, because I'm here to ask the dumb questions. And that's exactly what I did. Dr. Yan, then Sean Flavin of Cool Core, will be along after the Crawfords. To finish today, we have the second part of Chapter 13, or Day 12, of The Year We Seize the Day by Elizabeth Best and Colin Bowles. So, with another full show, let's get to Ben and Cammy Crawford, The Crawfords. Okay, we're on with The Crawfords, and, I, and if I remember correctly, I've got to get this right, since pressure, is Ben and Cammy, Dove, Eden, Seven, Memory, Philia, Philia rather, and of course that international superstar himself, Rainier. Hi guys, how are you? Hello. Wow. Good work remembering yeah. all those names. Good job. I've, got to, I've got to confess, I cheated. I wrote them down. <laughs> <laughs> it's still good. Say, <laughs> yeah, I know. That's right. <laughs> so first off, congratulations on your hike. It was amazing to watch those videos every day of you heading you know, further north. What's the? Was there a moment when you were actually doing the hike when you actually thought, we're going to do this? Yeah, probably. Um, I feel probably like three months into it i had this moment when we got to harper's ferry where we were all just in a line i was in the back as i usually am and i'm seeing all the kids and ben with our backpacks and i just got this real like proud moment of just oh my goodness we've gone almost halfway i think we're gonna do this thing <laughs> That was early, that was early to think that Kemi, I'll tell you. I guess so. I think for me it happened so. much much later. I mean, I think it was almost entering into the 100 mile wilderness or even exiting the 100 mile wilderness. Because for me, I just felt like with eight of us, we were one second away from an accident happening to anyone that would have ended our whole trip. Yeah. I thought that the whole way about you guys. So I well, never relaxed. Eight of you. Until yeah, I bet you didn't. End. Yeah, I bet you didn't. You know, one only one out of eight of you had to had to be off and that would have been it wouldn't it so it was uh it must have been real pressure so 
let's go back now to the decision to actually hike the 80 in the first place and, and kind of talk us through the mindset and why you thought it was possible in the first place. And I would note, by the way, that your intro to your videos includes, we don't know if we can finish it, but we're doing it together. <laughs> so, so how was that, you know, how did you put that to everybody when you first thought of doing this? Well, I think it's it's always so funny for us to hear that question because built into the question usually is this belief that it can't be done or shouldn't be done or something. And with our background, I don't think we ever assumed that. Like we've we've been doing difficult things as a family for a while now. Mm-hmm. And we always knew it was possible. It was more of a question of do we actually want to do this? Is it worth it? But whether or not kids could do it, you know, I don't think whatever that thing is in people's brains that says kids can't do that. I think that thing's like broken with us maybe Uh, (laughs) because we always knew they could. Uh, So it was kind of a question of when should we? The way in which I look at that though, and I entirely understand what you say, but, and it comes back to the response to, to what I said before, when I asked you before that literally any second, one of those eight, children could have injured themselves. So the odds of finishing are one in four. So in your case, the odds were even further against you. So that was really the thing. I, I think when taking an entire family and completing the trial with an entire family is so remarkable, I wondered how you actually got the mindset that you would all finish it. And that that part we never knew. You know, I think yeah, we, course, yeah. we held it pretty open-handed in being realistic that something could happen any time. You know, there's those stories about the things that take people off the trail, whether it's sickness or illness or injury. And I think we just had to be prepared for that. But that that would have never considered uh, we wouldn't have considered that a failure for us. Yeah, no, no. And you're right. Of course, it's uh, what just getting, as you say, said just now, coming getting to Harper's all of you together intact as a family was extraordinary. I remember thinking, well, if it has to stop now, you know, that was amazing. Yeah, but it just kind of kept going, didn't it? So who who raised who raised the idea in the first place then of doing the trial? Well, uh, pro- I think sixteen years ago we discovered the trail, um, and Ben wanted to hike it then, and I was not excited about that at all. Um, so, so we didn't. Uh, <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> and we had never done any backpacking at that point, so I was yeah. I was just learning about backpacking. And I was yeah. like, we should start with the AT. And and I <laughs> yeah, I had, I didn't have any uh experience in backpacking and we started backpacking as a family for the first time in 2009. Um we've done the Wonderland Trail around Mount Rainier five times now in the last 10 years. Yeah, really and yeah. it was after really probably the first time, but I, I think it was a gradual process for me um where I just started to fall in love with this the whole process of backpacking and and what it was doing for me and what it was doing for our family um and then in the last year and a half uh ben and i started having conversations about actually doing the at and we wanted to if we were going to do it we wanted to do it before our oldest dove turned 18 yeah so and by this time it was more cammy pushing it well i started watching videos of other through hikers um, and really started to get inspired by these videos. And sure. I was thinking, yeah, if this is our one, this is our one shot this summer. If we, if we want to do it all together. Um, so I think I just presented that to Ben. I said, I think we should do this. And he's like, well, I've been, I've been ready for 16 years. <laughs> So, okay. So the two of you thought you wanted to do it. So what about, uh, and was it always a case that, because I know your, your parents live just opposite you, don't they? Or just right by you, just behind yeah, you. Yeah, my, my parents live uh, right behind us. Yeah. So did you consider, I know you let, you, you allowed Dove and I think Eden the ability not to go, maybe Seven as well. Um, how did you break it to the kids? And did, was it a thing, if, obviously for the youngsters, they were going to go with you anyway, but how, how, what, how did the old ones take to it first off? You know, I don't really remember the exact conversation. They might have more of a memory of that, but it was not really a positive. They weren't excited about it. Uh, <laughs> I think predominantly because of the disruption that it would be to their life. They weren't afraid of the hiking piece 
mm-hmm. or the adventure or the difficulty. It was just leaving their friends for that long and their life as they knew it. Yeah, for that long. Yeah. Yeah. It's a long time, isn't it? The whole summer. It really is. Well, that, yeah. that virtually you know, half a year. It's the whole time, isn't it? Really? Yeah, beyond so, the summer. It was yeah. it was like moving. You know, that was that's what it felt like we were doing. It was, it's a whole lifestyle shift. So yeah, it was it was a tough thing to kind of state at first and and kind of our viewpoint on parenting was you can force kids to do things for short amounts of time, but that doesn't work very well for the long run. Sure. So that's why it was very important in the beginning for us to give them the choice, especially for the older kids, because um, we just needed them to know if they were there, it was because they chose it, not that they were being forced to do it. Wasn't it Eden at the end who was starting to have not so much second thoughts? She was, she kind of wanted to get off a bit. She'd had enough, hadn't she, at one stage? Uh, that was at about 20 stages. Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> pro- <laughs> probably beginning with week one. Um, but even that was, that was another important juncture because there was a point where halfway through, there was kind of a lot of complaining specifically from her. And it was, it was very challenging for her and her personality. And eventually we said, hey, listen, uh, we'll give you a way out. If you want to get off now, then mm-hmm. we want you to feel like you can make that choice. But if you want to stay, we can't have constant complaining. So those are your two options. And she chose to stay still. And it really helped because I think what she was doing before that is she, she had slipped into this mindset like, oh, I have to do this yes. again. My parents are making me. We're like, no, we're not making you. Do you want to do it or not? We'll support you either way. Um, we obviously think that it would be better for you to finish what you started. And we think that you can do it. And I think that was all that she needed to hear. And she chose it herself. Yeah, you gave her definitely gave her affirmation. She spoke to the camera a couple of times about that, didn't she? As well, yeah. And I and thought it, that was, and you could see it going through her mind. You know, very strong. It, I, you know, your kids, you, you gave them a lot of exposure out there, didn't you, to the camera, and uh, they took it. We tried. It was it was very challenging. Speaking of the video project or the vlog, everyone in the comments was saying, "We want to see more kids. We want to see more kids." And mm. You know, we do too. It's just, it's so hard when we're doing parenting and life and most of the trail, the day, you, you're not enjoying life. I mean, you're walking <laughs> up hills in the heat and the dust and the rain. And the last thing anyone wants is is an instant audience and to have to take the energy to process your inner thoughts, which is what vlogging is. So it was really challenging to find that balance, even as a producer of videos to say, what can my kids handle? What does the audience want? What's going to tell the story well? And what's going to be a good final story or product? Sure. I'm sure. I'm sure that's tr- true. But funny enough, some of the really great little things were you and Rania kind of almost chatting with each other on the way. And I don't know whether you would noticed it as it went along. I don't know whether you've seen the videos since. He progressed, obviously, as he would do at that age, so quickly, didn't he? It was extraordinary. You know, he, he you saw him almost grow up in, in front of your eyes. Yeah. I, I mean, it's... It's weird that people can see that on video because I don't, I didn't notice it. I mean, I believe it and I know <laughs> that he grew up, <laughs> yes. but for us, it was just, it's like watching a plant grow. You don't see it. It just happens. <laughs> big. Now, yeah. We mentioned how many, how many, is it, is it how many and Papa, your, oh. your, your mother and father? Yeah. How many and Papa? That's how many oh, right. is Korean for grandma. Okay. How many and Papa? That's right. They played a large part in the journey and the kids, and the kids are clearly, you know, really close to them. What was their reaction once you told them you were going to do this? Uh, I think they weren't surprised um, because we've done crazy things in the past, but I think it was um, hard for them because it was a long time and they've invested a lot in our family. And I think Ben's mom, she at one point, I think that first week she's because, you know, we're having problems that first week and, She's like, well, just so you know, it's not stupid if you quit. It's okay to quit. <laughs> and we're like, yeah, okay. they, they were, it wasn't. They were very supportive, but yeah, they were. but from uh, I don't think they really understand why we enjoy it so much yeah. or why we sacrifice so much to do things like this. Yeah, they were very sweet though. All the time, they they seemed to always give your kids a hug, and they wanted a they wanted to be part of it, didn't they? So that was uh, oh, it was a it was a huge motivation for us sure. and for our kids to have various sure. points where we would meet up with them. Now, your vlog was brought to my attention by a listener, and I can't remember when I first started watching. But my reaction was at the time, "There's no way you're going to make it," so I kind of stopped watching. 
Then a few weeks later, I heard you in the Smokies and I watched again. Not only were you still on the trail, but you were making such incredible content for the followers of your YouTube channel. Did the vlog almost take over the hike? And did you ever resent that commitment? There was a few times where it felt like we had tackled too much. I'm sure. Really, when we got to Maine, uh, there was, or actually, no, it was New Hampshire, the Whites. And there, the internet, uh, yes. we couldn't find internet. We were worn out emotionally and physically, and we stopped producing for about a week. But that was four months into it. Besides that, I think we had the discipline enough to separate the two. You know, the, the best thing that we ever did was releasing on a delay. So releasing two weeks later, which I'm sure, I'm felt, sure. felt like a suboptimal product to me in a way. Like I would have rather released them closer to live, but it gave us a two week buffer so that we never had to plan our, our trip around Wi-Fi or, you know, publishing. Yeah. So I, I felt like, you know, it didn't really, it did change our trip for sure. Like pulling out a camera and talking to it all the time changes things, but you know, I don't think it cost us a whole lot. Yeah. I think, I think, uh, doing it two years prior, um, has helped. I mean, it wasn't new to us No. and we always took the weekends off where we were pretty religious about that. Um, and I think that really helped. Yes, I'm, I'm sure. It, I'm sure it did. And but there is so much pressure to get this stuff out there. And you had these amazing um, drone shots. Who was carrying the drone? I know how much did it weigh? Me- Memory, our 11 year old, she was carrying the drone, and the whole package was about five and a half pounds. Wow. wow. So yeah, it was. I mean, it, it definitely changed our trip. And you know, we brought up, we carried a laptop, yeah, and three or four cameras at various times. So it was. It was a huge add-on in terms of, I mean, it, it did cost our trip. Uh, you know, I think it was about three hours extra a day was what I calculated about how long it took us yeah, to, to film and upload and edit. But that's divided among really eight people in a way because, well, maybe seven. Yes. Because, <laughs> yeah. because you know, we're all carrying well, the I weight. <laughs> Rania cam was pretty impressive, I've got to tell you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So for us though, it was just, it was just worth it uh, mm-hmm. in, in a couple of ways. One is we really, the trip was amazing for us. And to be able to share that with others is just one of the biggest joys of the journey. I'm sure. And second sure. of all, it really got people involved in our trip. People that met us along the way and invite us into their homes and talk to us on the trail. I mean, it was a totally different experience. That was really mm-hmm. incredible. Yeah, we yeah. really benefited from it, for sure. I'm sure you had a through hike like no other, though. You know, nobody else has had your sort of hike. You know, you you were so well known because of the videos, I'm sure, and the fact that you were hiking as a family. And the, the videos were really the icing on the cake, and that's how people met you. And throughout those videos, you refer to family meetings quite a lot, actually. Um, and I know family is really important to you, and I, I heard, heard you talk about parenting and so on. Have those meetings always been a part of your family life and how they work? Do you listen to everyone's views or, and make a decision with Cami or do you just take a straight vote? How do you do that? They have not always been a part of our family, but I think about 10 years ago, I know just for me as a dad, I started to take family more seriously and realize I don't think it's really a side project to work and education. <laughs> I feel like it's actually the main reason why we're here. One of the main reasons we're here. Sure. And and that became a game changer for me. So when you first start taking it seriously as just a working guy, I knew how to make decisions in the workplace. You yeah. have to get organized. You have to communicate well. You have to motivate people and and listen. And I just started to transfer some of those things I had learned in work to our home life. So the the types of meetings we have has changed a lot over the years. But we have a lot of meetings, way more meetings at home in our regular life than we do on the trail. The trail felt like just bare minimum. Oh, really? Yeah, because it was just like, we're so busy. I mean, you're just moving and trying to stay awake and alive. I mean, you know who has time for meetings? (laughs) So we just felt like we had to, to, I'd almost forget at times like, okay, we need to communicate about, you know, these plans and get the kids on board and listen to them. Yeah. At times it was the last thing we wanted to do, but 
we just knew that we had to do, we had to touch base at some point as a family to sure. keep, keep morale and to keep going. I'm sure. I'm sure. And it, but every night, it was often at nine or 10 at night, the kids were cooking and you were eating after a long day on the trail. I mean, that alone was tough. So to keep everyone together and making decisions. So, but the decisions were made by you and Cammy though, Ben, is that right? Well, quite often they were, or at least we knew what we wanted, but a lot of times we would bring that to the children. And if it wasn't unanimous, a lot of times we wouldn't move forward. And, you know, we have a lot of clout, so we can sway them, but we found that it's so much more valuable to say, Hey, this is what we're thinking. What do you think? Let's make a decision together. Then we can all own the decision instead of us just saying, Hey, we announced that we decided this. Mm -hmm. Right. And quite often our our decision would actually change when we heard the kid's perspective. Mm -hmm. I mean, having been a pretty lousy parent myself, I was was so impressed about how your calm authority you both have over your children without mandating anything. Is is that what is what happened on the trail indicative of how your children react to you at home or not? Or did they need to be more disciplined on the trail? I think there needed to have been more discipline on the trail. Uh, There's just not a whole lot of room for not to not have that for everything yes. to be going as smooth as possible. Yeah. Yeah. The way I see it is our, our life back home was almost like training for the trail in a way. Wow. All of the parenting that we did, it really kind of shined and came out on the trail. But by the time you get to the trail, it's almost too late to start instilling habits and yes. things. I mean, yes. I think you can do it, but there's so much pressure and other variables going on that, yeah, a lot of it happened at home beforehand. Now, and I loved how all the kids took responsibility for meals and carrying Rainier and so on, because, you know, to, to, for you to take Rainier all the time must would have been tough, must have been tough. Was that their decision or did you impose jobs upon them? Because I read somewhere, and it was somewhere I read it as opposed to you know, YouTubing it, that they decided to take on some of those jobs. Is that right? Yeah, well, it was really funny, actually, specifically with the carrying Rainier, which was, I think, the toughest job. I carried him for about 900 miles and I was dying. Uh, (laughs) My leg was numb. I had lost 30 pounds. I was the slowest person on the team and I needed to take breaks every 20 minutes. And emotionally, I was just beat. So we were going through the Shenandoahs and my oldest daughter, she was like kind of giving me like crap about it. She's like, oh, you guys are always slow. You guys are always behind. (laughs) And I was like, fine. You want to know what it feels like? Why don't you carry him for 30 minutes? And I was like thinking this is going to like teach her a lesson, you know, and she goes, fine, I will. So she did. And then she was like, she was like screaming in terms of speed. She was going so fast. (laughs) And I was like, what in the world? Like I was thinking I was the only person that could do this, you know, because I'm the strong dad. And, and it just, it taught me a lesson and she actually enjoyed it. I mean, there was kind of a honeymoon period at first for everyone that carried the baby just to prove that they could do it. (laughs) <laughs> and that eventually wore out. Quickly wore. Yeah. But, you know, they did volunteer because they they wanted to finish the trail and they knew that that was the better way to do it. And that yeah. was the case with probably most of the jobs. Um, now, there was times when, when people complained because when it's you're tired and it's late at night, like no one wants to go clean up the pot, you know, or find water. <laughs> yeah. But, Finding water, that's the worst job of all, isn't it? Mm. Dreadful, dreadful thing to do. Now, t- you talked about you you lost thirty you, you lost thirty pounds after nine hundred miles. Obviously, the one who put on weight would have been Rainier from when he started <laughs> to when he finished. How much did he weigh at the end, and how much was he when he when you started with him? I actually, I th- well, when we started, I think he was about twenty seven pounds, and then oh. I actually didn't weigh him when we got back, but I I did weigh him about a month before we we finished and he had maybe gained a pound, but I think he got taller. So I don't think he actually started gaining weight a ton. He just kind of stayed the same. Oh, wow. I'm really (laughs) surprised. I'm really surprised at that. I must admit, Mm -hmm. but you, you, I know you, you were very noticeable. Cammy, you were losing weight on the trail, weren't you? You looked like you were anyway. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, how much did you lose? I think I lost 25 pounds. Wow. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. something. What about the rest of them? Do they do they lose much weight? It's normally the guys who lose weight, not not the not the women. We yeah. never actually weighed the kids before or after. In fact, I hardly weighed myself except for I happened to be at a Korean spa, so I just like stepped on the scale, which I'm glad I did. 
But yeah, it wasn't a real, I wish we would have done that. Uh, kind of. The, the kids did a little bit and I don't think, I think they maybe lost a few pounds, but I actually think they stayed pretty consistent. I think they gained a lot of muscle too. Right, yeah, I'm sure they did. Yeah. Now I want to go back to, cause I, I went back this morning and watched the first day of your hike. <laughs> you went to the car park. This is probably the best video to watch actually, if you want to get, get into what this story is about. Mm-hmm. Um, you went to the car park, and then up the one or half a mile to Springer, took your pictures at Springer, looking incredibly miserable at the top. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's so miserable. Yeah. <laughs> Lost Rainier's rain pants straight away, which was impressive. <laughs> then, you, then you sat drying out in the back, you know, back of the, of the car or in the car, in the car park. How did you manage what must have been real doubts at that moment? Because you all looked so out of it. You didn't want to do it, did you? <laughs> uh... Man. I don't know. I mean, it was hard, but I think we knew it was going to be hard. Yeah. I we, don't think it surprised us. But, you know, the thing that was frustrating to me, and, and this came out in a lot of our video comments, is people were saying, like, oh, you guys are just moaning and groaning and complaining. <laughs> and we're like, well, it, it's the hardest thing we ever did in our life is transition from drinking coffee and smoking cigars on our porch yes. to optionally walking in the rain in 20 degrees. I mean, I can't think and, of a person. And smoking cigars. Yeah, I can't think of a person <laughs> alive that would be honest that that wouldn't be a very difficult transition for them to go through. Totally but the right. thought never occurred to us to quit. That, in fact, the re- that difficult the difficulty of the transition was the entire reason we did the trail. It was kind of to detox from everyday, you know, expectation of comfort. Interesting. As a family. So yeah. it, it was both of those things. It was it was so hard, you know, especially getting out, leaving a hotel where there was a pool and an all-you-can-eat yes. breakfast yes. to be in freezing rain and not being able to find your clothes. Like, yeah, it was a nightmare. Yeah, you had a really tough year to do it as well, didn't you? This The, the winter in those early months was really bad, wasn't it? We heard. That's what people said. It was the worst one in a long time. Yeah. And yeah. and the dropout rate was incredibly high. Yeah. But we di- we also knew in the back of our minds that, every day it would just get a little bit easier and it did every day it just got a little bit easier uh both in the weather and in our shape and in our emotional expectations sure you look you look like you were enjoying it a a whole lot more towards the end definitely and so how did you how do you two cope with the parental responsibilities when your children were suffering because i think rania got an infected eye the kids got things go wrong with them some had bad stomachs and things like that and there was no real access to doctors how did you get through that uh, and how did you manage that that was really hard i I think there's a belief that we have we have to be able to separate what is just discomfort and what is causing permanent damage and we have a very high priority in solving the permanent damage problem of course and i think a lot of our training as parents and as a family has been not necessarily to ignore the immediate discomfort, but to teach kids and ourselves that we have to be able to go through it together. So it's really hard at the end of a, you know, 20 mile day to hear kids crying and to say, you know, we have two more miles to go and I think we can make it. But there was some equivalent there with a lot of the sickness and difficulties that we faced. Yeah, and it's your face. It was your face, Cammy, that gave it away, really, because mm. on a couple of occasions, either you or the kids got lost. Mm. You you really looked panicked on several <laughs> yeah. occasions, which is understandable, by the way. <laughs> Who's your kids in the middle of the bloody woods? It would have been a bit of a nightmare, wouldn't it? Yeah, it is. <laughs> and then, yeah, then relief in finding them, you know. I, and I can see, I could, I could see the parental worry there. Anyway, and the parental worry was there when any, any of them were sick as well. Of course, it was. It was interesting to me though how you managed it, and uh, yeah, I, I understand that. And so, and, and and I know you got, and you referred to it just now, various comments. What did you think about? some of the earlier particularly the earlier online reactions to your journey because they weren't kind were they (laughs) no um yeah i i i mean we had some experience with negative comments but never to that degree um and so there were some pretty dark moments for ben Mm. and i on the trail early on uh, where, I mean, there's particularly one where, you know, we started reading some of the online stuff about us yeah. or about some caricature they were talking about. I don't, it wasn't really even us. And, and that's really what we had to do. We had to separate ourselves from 
like they're not talking about us. I mean, they are, but they really aren't. <laughs> I mean, it's so yeah. ridiculous. Um, they don't know us. And, you know, so I, it was hard. Um, but I think we just, we made some conscious choices to stop reading certain stuff. And, Good. Good. uh, and if we did see some stuff, we would talk through it with each other and say, yeah, that's they're you know, blowing this out of proportion. They don't even know, know us. Yeah. No. Had you, did your kids see any of it? I presume they did as well, didn't they? And how did they react to it? No, not really, because we didn't have online access. We hardly were able to find it unless we proactively okay. sought it out. Okay. And, you know, it's a lot of people in our our comment section of our videos said, oh, please tell the kids they're so awesome and they're doing great and this. And we didn't really pass on many of those messages to our kids because, I mean, it's just, it's just such a bizarre world we live in where 5,000 people can see your everyday walking in the woods. And we're trying to, as a family, we're trying to get away from uh, a lot of the general population's viewpoint and just to be together yeah. out there and protect ourselves from media. So we didn't really pass on most of the feedback, even the positive stuff. We just said, you know, we're just living life out here. And <laughs> yes. I'm sure they'll figure it out when they get older that people, they know people don't like us since a lot of people really like us. And yeah, you had tons of support though. I, I would I was actually reading your, your comments in your videos to see how supportive people got more and more supportive as it went on. People were thinking, Oh my god, they're gonna do this. It was fantastic. And they were but I, I really want to go back to that night spent in the bathroom at the new found gap in the middle of the smokies. And that was one of the most dramatic, one of the most gripping videos you, you had because I thought, this is crazy. How can they be doing this? It was snowing outside. And then the, <laughs> was it the following morning that the local child protection authorities turned up? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I saw what happened in the video. What was going on in your mind at that thought, at that point though? Well, we had just gotten out of the bathroom. We knew Ben's parents were on their way. So we were yeah. literally looking for them. And then before they could get to us, a sheriff got to us and we're right. like, oh, right. I mean, I just remember being like, oh, OK, someone got to got to them. And now yeah. we have to deal with this bullshit. And it's like, yeah. OK. <laughs> yeah, in a way, it's totally not surprising, like from the big picture level. But at the moment, it was so disappointing and frustrating to have that experience in what was one of our most celebratory moments. I agree. I I remember shouting at the screen. I was watching it on my TV, <laughs> thinking, "You." I, I, I said a bad. I said a bad word. A couple of bad words, in fact, actually. And, but I was just kind of wondering. You know, you stayed relatively calm, and, and it seems that the the authorities were very good and very polite. And, they were, yeah. And that really helped. I and mean, we had you have to stay calm. I think in those moments. I mean, I guess you don't have to, but it's really yeah. in our best interest to mm -hmm. cooperate. I think. And, and I didn't want to freak our kids out either. Of course. Yeah. I, say, I thought you handled it amazingly. I would never have been able to done that. I would have done as my ex-wife used to say to me, I would have got very British on them, <laughs> <laughs> which probably wouldn't have helped, by the way, especially in the South. Well, and partially I think we believe that we have nothing to hide. And I say that because, well, it is a little bit tricky when you're dealing with governmental authorities where – they, sometimes people have much different standards than you do for yeah, safety absolutely. or whatever. Yeah, yeah. But but we didn't have anything to hide, and I was I was fine with the truth coming out. I knew it was just a matter of time. Uh, but that doesn't make it, I guess, a little bit less scary because the way they deal with it, they separate you from your kids, and sure. we, we just never been through that before. I'm sure. Um, so yeah, it was tough. Yeah, I'm sure it was. Now, just because the, the hike was so darn easy, you went home to run a marathon. <laughs> which, I, which I thought that they, they cut, this must be a joke, you know, it was ridiculous. Uh, and was it, yeah. was it Flea, who's about seven or eight? She, she was kind of running, she was leading you all the way there, wasn't she? Oh, yeah. It was extraordinary. She, she got this burst of energy probably around mile 18, and it lasted for five miles. And I was just like, where is this coming from? I could not keep up with her. It was the weirdest thing. <laughs> that was funny. But, were you, were you well, well known then? I suppose you were. Because of your hike, people in the in the town knew you because you were wearing the same shirts, weren't you? Well, we're one of twenty thousand people in a crowd there still. Yeah. So pe a few people recognize us, and it's it's our hometown. So oh, yes, we saw right. some friends and family and things, but <laughs> I I don't know if that was a really good idea to do the marathon. We, we kind of decided <laughs> <You> to, <think? laughs> we, we wouldn't do it again. Well, now it sounds obvious to other people. I guess I wish someone would have told us. But you know, it was funny because we decided that it actually was still worth it. 
even though we wouldn't do it again. Uh, right. For us, it was a trip home, you know, and it was yes. Yes. it was a break from the trail. And it was something that we were familiar with. Our families run that marathon uh, five or six times together. Mm-hmm. So it, it made us feel normal. It's kind of funny. Yeah. But it did. <laughs> well, yeah, very normal. Yeah, going home for a marathon. <laughs> yeah. so, now, the last couple of weeks, a lot of us have caught up with your finish in the 100 mile wilderness. And what an amazing time you had in the 100 mile wilderness. Uh, it was you unbelievable. Had fresh, you had fresh ground as your short order chefs throughout the wilderness. Yeah. What did that mean to you? And would, would you like to talk about some of the incredible kindnesses heaped upon your family? Because you had them throughout the journey, didn't you? Mm hmm. We did. It, it was really the probably the largest unexpected and impactful part of our trip that made it. It was the trip in a lot of ways. I, I think a lot of people think of the Appalachian Trail and they think of the woods and isolation. That was like not our experience with the Appalachian Trail, or not at least what we'll remember. So sure. we we left for the trail and we had two invitations from people. And we thought, oh, that's going to be, we're going to be walking and staying in a tent and we're going to be staying with these two people. That's going to be our trip. And very quickly, you know, within the first month or two, people started reaching out to us uh, because of the YouTube videos predominantly. And it was the stuff that we experienced. I mean, I've never cried so many times and been so (laughs) excited as an adult and it really it's just the state that you're in as a hiker the other hikers who listen will know that when you when you come in from the cold and not taking a shower the simplest things back home that we take for granted now become life altering you know gifts Mm -hmm. agree and in a good way in a good way by the way that's a really good good thing to learn isn't it so it was so cool for our our family to be able to experience those things together and just be blown away together and i had to tell our kids you guys like not everyone experiences the appalachian trail this way because we had so (laughs) many people i mean yeah the the thing with fresh ground for the last week here we are like planning on going through the most remote section of the trail which for us meant carrying the most weight that we had carried the whole time. And, you know, we were just kind of like stealing ourselves up for this. And then the night before, um, poet from Shaw's and fresh ground and I have a meeting and he's like, I want to take care of your family through the trail with food and slack pack. You guys. Wow. I mean, it just, I was like, when I told the kids, I I think we didn't really capture on camera because it was just such a personal moment, but I'm like crying and just saying, you guys like, this is, it, there's no way this could be better than this, you know, yeah. to end the trail this way. Yeah, and we, we didn't ask for it. We weren't expecting it. it, it we never would have imagined to ask for that. I, you know, I got a bit tearful watching it. I did. Uh, it really touched me that people thought so much of what you were doing, that they were prepared to put themselves. I actually spoke to Fresh Ground. I was going to interview him and, I, and we had bad, we had a bad line. But I thought to myself, what a kind man to do that. And he, it was almost as if it was absolutely no trouble at all, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. Well, you know, the yeah. thing that we learned, because at first it's very difficult to accept help from people. Some people would offer to drive like three hours just to bring us, you know, a yeah. meal. And we're like, hey, that's not very practical. Like, d- don't worry about it, is what I was tempted to say. But yeah. then I, you know, part of the way through, I think we realized that everyone's living their own story and they're getting something out of it too. And, they, totally. you know, they're doing their own thing. And I don't know what's in their heart. Some people are just really kind and generous. Some people are getting very inspired and, you know, meeting us, it sounds kind of silly, but meeting us could be the highlight of their week just because, <laughs> you know, it, what we're doing or even being connected to the Appalachian Trail gives them some sort of inspiration. And I know Fresh Ground his, has his own spiritual story where he believes he's living in obedience to what he thinks God is telling him to do. So it was just so cool to meet people that are, you know, we don't know what they're about. Yeah. Aren't you struck by that? You run into people from all sorts of different walks of life. You probably wouldn't meet in everyday life. Mm -hmm. You know, you're just exposed to everything, aren't you? Every part of life. And and most people, I think 95, 98% of people are kind, aren't they? Yeah. Oh, it was, it was such a different feel what we met in person than what we experienced online. Right. And, and that's it was it was so kind. Now I want to finish a course on Katahdin, Um and you learned that you weren't going to be able to take Rainier to the top because of the rules about kids under five. I'm not going to bother getting into all that sort of you know why. But another family meeting, and you decided to finish just above tree line, and I literally applauded when I heard that. By the way, because you all gave up 
for Rainier, even though he probably wouldn't have remembered it, you all gave up for Rainier, that finish at the top of the sign. But then you had those incredible people who turned up and they just with your mini Katahdin sign. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that moment. That was just extraordinary to see. It it was amazing. Um, I mean, yeah, just to revisit the decision itself. I, you know, there's a lot of discussion around, uh, will Rainier remember it or were we shortchanging our family, but not by not going all the way. Yeah. But I don't think people realize, I mean, I didn't realize how much, I mean, we're taking Rainier for Rainier, but he had much more of a positive impact on us as a family sure. than I I'm think sure. we had on him. I'm sure. And you can see it with the kids as well. Ben. You can see it with the kids. Yeah. And, and he brought joy and laughter and unity and we could have, we could have left him and I don't think he'd remember or care in the long run, but I think it would have said something to us. And I was so proud of the kids when they made that decision. Yeah. Um, so was I. I, you know, we, we get invested in this. I don't think you quite realize the impact this has. I mean, I, I'm, I'm a, I'm a 65 year old bloke and I'm a fan because watching how you did this as a family and finishing where you finished, I remember, remember exactly where that was it's amazing that this was your finish. And they gave you that sign, those those youngsters turning up and that guy drove about <laughs> eight hours, I think, to get there. I mean, it was just mm-hmm. bloody amazing to me. It really was. It was it was really unbelievable. And it was something that we would not have been able to architect ourselves. And, you know, in a way, uh, we were so disappointed at first, I think just because we were, we had hopes of being able to finish the sign because we see all these right. pictures of people. But very quickly, I think we realized especially at the end, this, this ending for our family was the absolute best case scenario. Yeah. We, I would have rather ended with those people in that place than touch the sign just like everyone else, even though yeah. I never would have chosen that. Um, and we, we didn't keep the sign. The sign was made by a guy named Hudson from Beardwoods Hostel. Yep. And yep. he loaned it to us for that day, even though he made All it right. for that experience. But it is on display at that hostel. So if anyone wants to see it, they can go there. Yep. Very cool. And he said he was keeping it there to remember us by. He did give us a souvenir and a gift to remember him. <laughs> so if anyone yep. wants to go there, they can see it there. That's nice. So now you've been, uh, you went you went to a camp. Is it some sort of camp somewhere in the, the, the West Coast um, after the hike? Are you back home now or are you still out West? We're still out West. All oh, right. Okay. Yeah. And how's everybody processing the hike? Or is because they've had something else to do? Are they still? Are they moving on pretty quickly? I think it's more been that we they're just slammed with cousins and pools and trampolines and popsicles, and we're just kind of in relaxation mode still. In fact, Dev and I tried to do a hike the other day, and we quit about ten percent of the way in because I just wasn't ready. I thought I was like physically and emotionally. And I got to a hard part where I was just going to have, we're going to have to like push through. And I was like, you know what? I don't want to. Like I, I, uh, I, I've been pushing for five months now and I, I just don't have the mojo right now. So you lost it, Ben. You even crashed your, you even crashed your drone into one of the trees. Oh, didn't you? I totally yeah. did. It's, we're falling apart, but no, we're, we are. Uh, I think our bodies physically I've almost been feeling it more than emotionally at least with Ben and I like I think yeah. he wanted to do this hike because he, he was just sick of sitting around yeah. and for me I had like three or four days of just like leg aches I think my my, right. my body was like what are you doing <laughs> and how about the children how have they, how have they reco- are they recovering pretty quickly yeah we haven't noticed any I mean it would almost be like we never even went on the hike like watching them, so they're, they're having a blast. And and I did notice, so we did this presentation for our family the other day with all my aunts and uncles out here because all our family's out here. So we did a slideshow. I saw, yeah. and, and someone asked the question, was it worth it? I think it was one of their cousins. So everyone answered it. Mm-hmm. And Eden sat there for like 20 seconds, you know, in front of everyone. Mm-hmm. I could tell she like, she did not want to admit that she... <laughs> that it was. And finally she said, yeah, it was, I think it was worth it. <laughs> oh, so it's, it's so funny how we're even far enough removed now that I think people are not remembering the difficulty or pain. Well, that's where the value of the vlogs going to come in. When you're older, you're going to look at yeah. that and you're going to look back and it. it's going to be fabulous. You know, mm-hmm. well, look, I, I really appreciate you taking the time. Um, 
And I say, I was so looking forward to speaking to you guys for, for months now because I just, I'm blown away by what you did. I think it's just remarkable. And I just commend you so much for doing it and, and just parenting those kids the way you have because I, I thought they're all stars in their own right. And I'm not just saying that. Well, I wouldn't say anything about it otherwise, but they're all stars. I thought they just did a great job, all of them. So thanks very much indeed. Well, thank you. And, and yeah. we, it was a privilege for us to be able to spend time on this place, this Appalachian Trail, and, and meet the people we did. And, Mm-hmm. And w- yeah. whatever people saw in the videos is just 10% of the goodness that we experienced out there as parents and hikers. Yeah. So it's, it's so fun to be able to share that with others because there was so much out there. Okay, guys. Well, thanks very much. And um, hopefully we'll speak again one day. Yeah, thanks, Steve. Thank you. Take it easy. Bye. 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 Now, I know that some of you have a visceral reaction to this family, and I think that's a shame. I feel sure, however, that the vast majority of you were celebrating with them as they completed their hike just above Tree Line on Katahdin. It was such the right decision to finish as a family in my book that it couldn't have been more perfect, unless, of course, Baxter had relented and allowed Rania to go to the top with them. As Jennifer Farr Davis told us last week, she was eight months pregnant when she did Katahdin, so go figure what that means. If you haven't followed the Crawfords vlog, I strongly advise you to get into it. You'll be amazed at their resilience and, importantly, how kind everybody was toward them as they got nearer and nearer Katahdin. And I thought it was interesting how Ben was prepared to accept his own deficiencies as a parent, with Dove carrying Rainier when Ben thought that he was the only one who could do it. He learned a lot and he was prepared to admit when he was wrong. The negative comments on social media are more a symptom of who we've become as a society than a true reflection of the trail, in my view. So Ben and Cammy were able to brush those off with a lot of grace, I thought. Why people feel that they have the right to criticise others' choices when they're behind a computer, I just do not know. As I say, if you haven't seen the vlog, give it a chance. You'll see a close family doing everything as a family. I'm not sure how much better it it could be than that. Even Eden thought it was worth it in the end. Don't forget, this show will be changing its format soon when I head to Spain and podcast from the Camino de Santiago. For the sake of logistics, I'm still going to have it under Mighty Blue on the Appalachian Trail, so you're going to find it in all the same places. But I'll have a different music, a different intro, and we'll be giving my reflections of the Camino and interviewing fellow pilgrims on the way. I hope that you enjoy this format, because I'm then going to use it to podcast on the AT next year. To learn about when shows are available, just make sure that you like the Hiking Radio Network Facebook page, and you'll get the first notifications. Oh, one more thing. If you know others who are interested in hiking, just share my Facebook posts with those people or even groups of people you may know. Thanks very much indeed. Now, a little side project that I accidentally took on at the Outdoor Retailers Summer Market in Denver in July. I received an invitation to come and have a chat at the show with Dr. Jan Beringer of Hornstein. The email said that they were an independent textile testing and research institute. It didn't sound terribly promising, but I was hooked as soon as I started chatting with Dr. Yan. So while there are no sexy products to talk about, he was able to work in the concept of stinky molecules. Listen to why this work is important and consider some of the ramifications of the existence of such a company. Here's Dr. Jan. Okay, I'm going to screw this up, but uh, I'm going to introduce you to Jan Beringer from Hohenstein. Hohenstein, uh, And this is a company that basically tests some of the spurious claims perhaps some of the more outlandish claims that gear companies make for their gear is that kind of what you do yeah that's perfectly correct so um, companies that really want to substantiate their claims that they're making with uh, scientific and technical data they approach us to um, do some testing on um, especially these kind of purposes that are claimed and um, we um, get the data from our physical testing systems to substantiate these kinds of claims. So what, what's the history of the company? When were we formed? Uh, Hohenstein was founded in 1946 by the grandfather of our current CEO. So it's actually a family-owned, uh, uh, small and medium-sized enterprise, so a, um, a private business. We are not funded by the German government or by the German federal state. So we are a profit-driven company. And how do you make your profit? You get, you get a company make claims or they ask you to test what they have and you tell them what claims they can make. Which way around, <laughs> which way around does it work? Well, it actually works both ways. So um, sometimes companies approach us, we have this claim, please provide some kind of testing data to, sub- to substantiate this claim. Or the other way would be companies saying, we have this material that can do this kind of thing. 
and what would be the perfect claim to uh, be substantiated by technical data. So are you, are you the, the only one in the industry or are you the industry leader? Um, let's say we are the industry leader from um, the scientific point of view. So all our testing is based on our R&D. So we're doing R&D since 60 years now, especially in performance testing. Well, that's what I meant, because, because they could say it's been tested, but it may not have been scientifically tested. So, right. so is, it, is, is a seal of approval from Hohenstein man, this is driving me crazy. <laughs> is a seal of approval from Hohenstein uh, is, is what companies need? Do they make that claim? or I mean, how do, how do they do this? They, they, I, I see some of, the, some of these ridiculous claims that some of the companies make, and I think, that cannot be true. But yeah. if they say it's been tested, or do you actually give them a seal of approval? Yeah. Well, you, you of course, can always pick, uh, let's say, a testing method that gives you some kind of a value or, or, or a kind of a data. But this data doesn't necessarily really correspond to the real world out, outside there. Right. So what we focus on is uh, physics in terms of comfort. This is all processes that are just controlled by regular physics. So it's the law of physics. And we also take into account the thermoregulation of the human being. So all human beings work exactly the same. Uh, physics works exactly the same all over the planet. And all our testing is based on these two main pillars um, real-world scenarios relevant for human beings based on physics. Well, one of the things I've seen since I've been at this show is people making claims about um, they can control odour. Trust me, having hiked the Appalachian Trail for six months, <laughs> controlling odour would have been great, but it yeah. was not possible. Yeah. So what sort of claim do they make and how do you test how that can yeah. How that works? Yeah. Well, with with odor control, you actually have have two approaches. So, so the first approach, which has been uh, pursued for the last years, is kind of uh, testing for antimicrobial activities. Right. So the theory behind it: um, uh, odor is generated by bacteria. This is correct. And if there are no bacteria, no odor is generated. Um, this is oh, it's as simple as that. Yeah. This, oh man. Well, well, this m looks like as simple as that, but, oh, right. but, but it actually is not. Obviously not. <laughs> so, so for example, if you have an antimicrobial textile, so all the germs that are growing in the textile, processing your sweat, generating these stinky molecules, they are being killed. But you have still germs on your skin that also process your sweat on the skin and generate the stinky molecules. These stinky molecules kind of go into the is textile. Is that the technical term, by the way? Pardon? Stinky molecule, is that a technical term? <laughs> well, I, I love the way you keep it at my level. <laughs> well, odor, odor generating molecules. No, right, right, this, stinky molecules this, <laughs> this would be the more, let's say, <laughs> scientific approach, but um, we like to um, yeah, put things very much to the point. Well, those, those odor, odor generating molecules, those stinky molecules, they then kind of migrate to the textile that you wear and get kind of fixed in the textile, even if the textile is antimicrobial, because the antimicrobial agent does not work on stinky molecules, right, it works right, on right. germs. So, um, so the, claim, the claims they can make yeah. must be quite limited and really well worded, mustn't they? Actually, this is correct. And this is why we set up a new testing scenario for odor control. It is not focusing on antimicrobial activities, it is focusing on the odor generation. So we have established kind of a laboratory method where we incubate textiles with stinky molecules. Um, and uh, after a certain time, real people, which are called sniffers, they are actually, <laughs> which are, they are, they are, Excellent. They are, they are actually validated and calibrated. So, so that is a job. No, no, yes, yes, this is this is not a joke. This is, this is excellent. It's actually real. So, this person, they are calibrated to um, smelling certain substances, and we use a device called olfactometer that kind of dilutes. Uh, the, the olfactory nerve. Is it the olfactory yeah. nerve? Yeah. Right. Uh, that, that kind of dilutes the stinky molecules that are coming from the textile. And, yeah. and, and the persons, they have, to real give, they have to give an evaluation when the molecules, when they s smell the molecules and which kind of intensity they smell the molecules. And for example, if you have an antimicrobial textile, um, this doesn't work any longer in this real world scenario because we impregnate the textile with stinky substances. Right. And there are no bacteria. Uh, there anymore. So, for example, if a textile has an odor control technology, which is coming very new to the market, that yeah. is not based on antimicrobial, but based on, let's say, capturing stinky molecules and yeah. releasing stinky molecules sure. during the laundry, they work in this test scenario. Wow. So, the real-world scenario is testing on odor, 
at not testing on antimicrobial activity. Right. Antimicrobial okay. activity is very relevant for food processing industry, healthcare industry, so sure. that, that there are no germs in um, uh, operating gowns, for example, or in all the garments that are worn during the food process. And you mentioned earlier on, I mean, I think we've had enough stinky microbes right now, <laughs> uh, but you mentioned earlier on that you were, um, you, you can measure comfort. You yeah. Do, how do you measure comfort? Well, isn't, that, isn't that entirely objective? Yeah. Um, we say it's subjective. So um, everybody perceives comfort differently. But what is... Sorry, subjective. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. But it's... <laughs> I always get that wrong. <laughs> um, of course, everybody perceives comfort differently. Yeah. But um, uh, in terms of physics and uh, in terms of correlation to human thermoregulation, we can measure the processes that are behind moisture transport in the garment and heat right. transport in the okay. garment. And uh, we have been doing this for over 60 years now, and uh, we have succeeded to correlate the physical measurements with about 80% um, of being representative for human beings. So our measurements, we can exactly say how 80% of the human beings might or will perceive this thermal and wow. moisture comfort. So what do you see is the, or do you see things happening now that haven't hit the market yet in terms of the stuff that you do? You know, there are, there are things that you're working on right now that we're going to see next year as hikers. Well, things we are working on right now with with clients, I am not allowed to tell. Oh. So. <laughs> but, but give me uh, some that have just come out then. Yeah, yeah. Well, what we've, what we have been working on very intensively uh, in the past was cooling. And um, this has now kind of penetrated the market. There are a lot of companies out there that claim also cooling for their products. We had yeah. this before, some claiming of very um, creative terms or creative claims uh, about cooling, some uh, doing it really straightforward. So uh, we have focused on the so-called evaporative heat loss. Of, um, <laughs> that lady pours the ice yeah. next well, to uh, Evaporated heat loss, yes. We have focused on the so-called evaporative heat loss. Yeah. And this is actually the process that is happening when you are getting too warm. When you're getting too warm, you start to sweat. Yeah. And uh, sweating is our inbuilt air condition yep. from, yep. From, uh, yeah, yeah. From, from the human being side of you. Yeah. And um, by evaporation of the sweat, this takes a lot of energy in terms of physics. Um, when the sweat is going from water to water vapor, this takes a lot of energy, and this energy is dragged out of the human body as thermal system. So therefore, it cools us down. Right. And uh, the fabric has the ability to, um, uh, to improve this evaporative heat loss and also to boost this evaporative heat loss. So, for example, just speaking very straightforward, it is more effective uh, to wear a textile when you're sweating, uh, let's say the right textile when you're sweating, than being naked. Because the textile is able to evaporate your sweat much more it, it, efficiently. It makes, than, makes it more efficient, the process more efficient. Yeah. So for example, um, the, human, wow. the human body has a surface area of about two square meters. Um, I've got, I've got a bit more myself. But. <laughs> yeah, this is, this, is, this is why I say about. about. So it, so he was looking, by the way, he was looking at me when he said that. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes it's less, sometimes it's more. It just, it just depends on your overall dimensions. Um, well, and, and um, a fabric, for example, if you take a look at a T-shirt, the, the available surface area for evaporation is almost 200 square meters. So, oh. so because of the very tiny structures of the filaments, of the yarns, so every single filament has a surface and we have uh, thousands of filament in, 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 a, in a fabric, we have a very high available surface area for evaporation. And this is why it works better than the human skin. That is amazing. I've got to say, I didn't really know what which way direction this was going to go. I didn't even think of questions beforehand, but as soon as we started talking, I got more and more interested. But I really appreciate the time you spent talking with us. And uh, sure. can people find out more? Just go to, go to your website. Is that the answer or contact you guys or not? Yeah, sure. Uh, they can contact us. And let's say the person that worked with Hohenstein, they usually advertise it in their marketing material okay. that we have substantiated uh, their claims in odor, performance, comfort, cooling. So um, our requirement would be to watch out for Hohenstein citations in the marketing material of companies. If Hohenstein is cited, uh, the person who wears this kind of garment can really rely on our uh, testing evaluations. Well, uh, it's been really interesting. I really appreciate you talking to me. Thanks very sure. much today. Thank you. Pleasure. Cheers. I don't know about you, but I found that fascinating.
So much so that when I turned off my recording device, I asked Dr. Yan if he could direct me to somebody who might talk about the real-life application of this science. This is what led me to Sean Flavin, Director of Textile Engineering at CoolCore. Here's Sean. Right, I'm here with Sean Flavin of CoolCore. Uh, I, I was um, sent over to Sean by Hornstein to complete the, complete the circle. And it's really what value you put on the uh, approval that, or the, the validation of your claims that Hohenstein accepts in their, with their science? Well, the validation comes from it actually being legitimate science. Yeah. There's a lot of people that can go out and make claims and say they do this, they do that, they do this better, but you really want to prove it in what the science is. So we worked with Hohenstein uh, for many, many years, working on developing lots of different tests, and what we feel is they really have the best test that represents what the actual function is going to be on the wearer, right. not just a lab test that says, oh, we measured this one measurement. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's comfortable. Uh, I use the example of wicking. The standard vertical wicking test is basically taking a piece of fabric, dipping it in water, and measuring how high it comes up or wicks oh, really? through the fabric. Oh, really? <laughs> that's exactly what the test right, is. That's, that test is uh, you know, 40 plus years old. The yeah. problem with that test is newspaper will actually score very well on that test. That doesn't mean that it's comfortable, That's nor right. do I want to wear it. That's right. So with Hohenstein, we've taken leaps and bounds against what a lot of the other tests are out there, out of the lab, still in the lab, but taking what it's going to mean to the actual wearer. So that's interesting to me. Um, if other companies make what turn out to be spurious claims, mm -hmm. and they have it tested by another testing company, and obviously don't name any names, but can they, they can get away with that, can't they? So how, how do you educate your consumer to make sure that these things are tested properly? Uh, that's a fantastic question, and that's really been one of the challenges as a, a growing young brand that has the integrity to maintain with the exact science and how that's going to go out and mean something to somebody, mean something to the end user. And realistically, the best way is to just have the conversations, to try and educate, to dig into the science, take the time, and explain it from a standpoint of what it means in real life versus laboratory test procedure one, two, three, scored yeah. 10.39 units of whatever. That doesn't really translate very <laughs> well to the ex head, exactly. Yeah. exactly. Exactly. I didn't give you any specifics on that, but that's what it sounds like to the average consumer. Mm. So what we really have to do is say, here's the test, here's how we did the test, and here is what it means. It's going to wick moisture into the material, transport the moisture across the material 360 degrees, make it available for re regulated evaporative cooling, and that cooling is going to cool the body, uh, increase your energy, uh, maintain your ability to so, continue so, so going. So let me get this then. So Cool Care have products which literally can cool the body. And, and I think one of the guys said to me the other day, said to me earlier on rather, not when we were on mic, but he said that you are better protected by wearing some of these shirts than you are if you're naked. You cool down better than you do if you're naked. Correct. Which makes no sense at all intuitively, does it? Well, it doesn't, but when you think about what we, where you sweat. You sweat in the armpits, the yeah, yeah. center of the chest, the small yeah, yeah. of the back. Yeah. When you're wearing a cool core well, shirt. I'm hiking all over, actually. Well, sometimes, <laughs> depends on the day, right? Yeah. But when, when you're wearing a cool core shirt, that moisture goes is pulled away from those areas. So it's pulling it away from the high sweat areas and transporting the moisture across the fabric and making it available for regulated cooling. So that evaporation, that's the, nat the body's natural mechanism yeah, yeah. for cooling, is the enthalpy of vaporization, or the phase change from liquid water to vapor. What we do is we move that liquid and get it available on such a large surface area to become vapor and evaporate and cool off the body faster. Wow. And then when it's, it, you don't get the full saturation because we're moving it and evaporating it, and then when you stop, when you're on your cool down, your shirt's not soaking wet. You kind of get to a point of about damp, and then it dries, and then you're comfortable because you don't want to be soaking wet. So you do, and, and I haven't looked into this part of it, you do apparel with, with this technology built in the whole time? Uh, we're primarily a fabric producer, yeah. but we have done apparel. We, we, we do apparel to kind of like uh, do a, like a test kitchen All right. where we're able to, I can build a couple of garments and get it on athletes and test it within two months. Yeah. If I wait for a brand, I got to wait until their seasonal buy-ins and things like this. Sure, sure. So we make, you know, it's not our, it's not our primary business, but we make, you know, a handful of small giveaways to get people to try. Uh, 
Yeah. <laughs> no, the, the audience wouldn't know this. I just put my hand up, volunteering for a giveaway <laughs> to try something. <laughs> well, we don't give a ton away, but you know, sure, we can work something out. Well, look, I mean, I, I think this is a fascinating subject, and I may be the only person who does, but my listeners might be interested. How can they find out more about what you do and and the value you, you put in in the t proper testing of your products and your claims? Well, we could certainly give you a link to our website, which kind of gives you the rundown of it. And then, you know, if anybody's interested in talking more, there's uh, ways to contact us through the website, and we'd cool. be happy to have a conversation with anyone who's interested. Appreciate it. Thanks so much for your time. All right. Thank Cheers. you. <laughs> so there you have it. This is important stuff, and finding out how valid some of these claims are could well inform the decisions you make when you next invest in equipment. Hope you enjoyed that as much as I did, because as you can tell, I enjoyed it a lot. Next week, my guest is Cindy Ross. Cindy has completed the Triple Crown of Hiking, written six books on adventuring in the outdoors, including Scraping Heaven, a family's journey along the continental divide. In this one, <laughs> Cindy and her husband led their young children 3,100 miles across the Rocky Mountain wilderness on the backs of llamas. <laughs> who would not want to speak with somebody who's done that? You're going to enjoy hearing from Cindy. Now, the second part of day 12 of the year we seize the day. Ellie has left Colin behind for the day and is heading to San Juan. Colin, with a day off, has way too much time on his hands and spends some of it contemplating the divine. I'll see you next week. <music>is Jesus a good thing? The day off allows me to see the life of an old bag without pilgrims. Sylvie's husband is the retired director of a large Swiss bank. This morning I watch him sluicing out the bathrooms. Sylvie tells me this is how they are spending their holidays this year. They are both extraordinarily kind to me. They show me more Christian charity than the nun in Chickentown. What is it about the Camino that makes bank directors want to come back and voluntarily clean out toilets instead of sipping cocktails in the Caribbean? Sylvie tries to explain it to me. It surprises me because when I do the way, you know, it is nothing special to me. But then, in the next year, I have, what you call it, flashbacks of things I have seen on the way. But I did not remember because I was so focused inside, on my thoughts, on my feet, you understand? And then every night I keep dreaming of the way. My husband too. And so this year, we came back. I think I know what she means. I'm not a religious man, as Mother Mary Goebbels will attest, but already there is something about the Camino I cannot explain. It is not a religious experience, for what has happened so far is that I have been repelled by the imagery here. The crucifixes in Navarran and Castilian churches are neither refined nor subtle. In anatomically precise detail, they show the exact musculature and exquisite agony of a beautiful young man being slowly tortured to death. These Spanish churches are a rich stew of imagery, saints, gods and bishops. Some of the statuary reminds me of the ride I used to go on at the amusement park in South End when I was a kid, specifically the ghost train. For example, in many churches you will find, in the gloom under the vaulted arches, Mary depicted as a life-size cupid doll in a black mantilla, weeping with a lace handkerchief to her face above a cross-section of a tomb where Jesus lies in a glass coffin, face twisted from the pain of his death. It is a terrifying image. Redemption Dogs by Tarantino. This is the Christ, the spiritual hero of much of the Western world, doing this for us. Martyrdom and suffering are supposed to be the way to a good and holy life. But is Jesus really a good thing? Above anything he said or did, his ultimate legacy to us is sacrifice. Is this really the way to a fully realised life? I don't want him, whoever he really was, to die for me, as the Catholics say he has. He cannot die for my sins anyway. I've watched my chickens come home to roost, with or without him, as they surely must with us all if we are to learn anything from our lives. He can't change that. Sylvia tells me what she has learned from the Camino. Everything you need is here, every day. There are little gifts. If you think of what you need, you say it and you get it. You say it and you get it. Could that be true? Her words echo in my head for days, weeks afterwards. You say it and you get it just not in the way you expect, perhaps. I know what I need right now, though. A decent pair of hiking sandals. Ellie, a stone of my own. The path enters a lush forest. There is a canopy of leafy ferns and beams of light shoot through the greenery, forming patterns on my skin. 
Spiders, bugs and giant slugs clung to the branches. The views are hidden, but an occasional glimpse between the trees reveals a stunning panorama of hilltops and valleys. I've stepped off the highway into a tropical wonderland that reminds me of the rainforests of northern Queensland. At the summit ridge, the landscape flattens out across a forested plain. I stumble upon a giant arrow, two metres in length, made of piled high pebbles stacked in the middle of the path, a reminder of past pilgrims pointing the way to Santiago. It's encouraging, and in keeping with tradition, I stop for a moment to lay a stone for the pilgrims behind me. Walking alone offers a different perspective. Alone, but never lonely. It's a different kind of freedom. Your own wants, needs, feelings and desires are all that matter. I see myself differently. It also changes the way other people perceive you in return. People I've only seen from afar make the effort to wander up close to my side and start conversations. Those who I have spoken to previously open up in different ways. I meet more people in the next two hours than I have in 12 days. After hooking along like an athlete in the Olympic walk event, Canada approaches and slows down for a chat. He set out at two hours after I did this morning, but there's a reason for his cracking pace. He's hoping to cover more than 50 kilometres by the end of the day. I tell him he's mad and he agrees. Canada's running out of time before he needs to return to start the school year and looks like having to bus through some of the way. He's disappointed, but his feet aren't, and they're down to the final weeping layers. I wish him well before stopping for lunch at a clearing. Squeezing canned tuna and warm cheese into a grain bread roll, I sit briefly to enjoy the view. Moving on, I catch up with a group of young German boys, walking part of the Camino for a schooled excursion. They speak fluent English because they are studying the language intensively at school. The smallest in the group is a cutie with loads of character. He tells me this section of the Camino was dreaded in the Middle Ages, as it was full of bandits and wolves. Many pilgrims lost their way in the forest. San Juan de Ortega was a 12th century monk who constructed the monastery in the heart of the long, formerly desolate stretch to offer protection and refuge to pilgrims. I tell him his knowledge is welcome, as I have no guidebook and no map. The other boys tease him and offer him up as my very own personal guide, saying he has a crush and admitting they've been watching me from a distance all day. The trinity of church bells of San Juan de Artiga is a welcome sight through the trees. Outside the attached Elberg lies a long line of backpacks, their owners hovering outside a bar across the square. A backpack placed at the door of an Elberg generally assures its owner a bed inside. In this case, most beds have already been reserved. The doors have not even opened and already just three remain. Sitting under one of only two umbrellas, shading more than a dozen weary pilgrims, are Mercedes and Simon. Hola guapa, Mercedes shouts. Que tal, que tal? Hola chica, bien? Relieved to see familiar faces, we kiss and hug before I join them at the table. How's the knee? Simon asks. It's okay. How are you guys? We're trying to decide whether or not to keep going. Will you have to stay? Simon asks, pointing to my knee. Not sure yet. It's too hot to go much further, but I think it's best to push on while my leg's still warm. What do you think? Just a few minutes sitting down and already fluid begins to flood the joint. Mercedes disappears inside the bar. Shaking his head, Simon drags another chair in front of me, lifting my foot onto it to try to minimise the swelling. Mercedes returns with a bag of ice. Packing it around the injury, she says she'd rather go on as well. She's also developed tendonitis in one of her knees and is keen to continue before she cools down. Typically, Simon doesn't mind either way. His only concern is Mercedes, though it seems her only concern is my knee. They're a rare couple, generous, honest and authentic. The kind of people you instantly warm to. The bond between pilgrims is one based on respect. It takes a certain personal quality to set yourself such a challenge and their nature of the people you meet generally reflects some aspects of the humility that the trail demands. More pilgrims arrive as we talk, reserving the remaining beds, and the decision to stay or move on is made for us. Vamos, Simon suggests, and together the three of us set off at a puesa. By 5pm I've covered 31 kilometres, the longest distance I've walked so far in a single day. Colin, Bellorado. I spent a week there one afternoon. Here's the good news. 
Television in Spain is every bit as dire as it is everywhere else. I'm sitting in a bar in Belorado watching a sitcom about a matrimonial agency. One of the actors is portraying toughness by continually hitting himself on the nose with his thumb. The barmaid is sitting on a stool behind the bar with the defeated look of someone who has found out her house has burned down and a car has been stolen. She's picking her nose and channel surfing. Flick. A woman making love to a chair. Flick. A woman wearing too much makeup making love to a microphone. Flick, Spanish MTV, a clone of Enrique Iglesias, singing about how much he'd be in love with his girlfriend if he wasn't already in love with his hair. Flick, a Jai game, a Spanish version of squash, played in a casino where the spectators shout at each other and the players try to ignore them. Flick, back to the matrimonial agency where the truck driver is still punching himself on the nose and arguing with the proprietor for sending his girlfriend on a date with some poor bastard who in the next scene is in a full body cast and being fed through a tube. A Spanish bodega consists of a wall-mounted television, a poker machine and a row of bottles on glass shelves with every strong liquor known to man, all covered with two inches of dust and, of course, lying under glass, three bocadillos as dry as a dead pharaoh. And always, but always, a man leaning on the bar drinking beer with hair in his ears thick enough to snare a moth and a coffee machine. I spend a week in Belorado one afternoon drinking beer and eating chocolate croissants. A word here about croissants. Treat them like cocaine and blondes. They're so good you should stay away from them. Or you'll get addicted and then you're Ellie told me about a friend of hers, a young bloke sculpted out of testosterone and rock-hard protein, a living Adonis with a six-pack as hard as a hessian bag full of potatoes, who came to Spain for a short holiday, got hooked on chocolate croissants and put on 20 kilos in a month. Ended up looking like Homer Simpson. True story. For some reason, a gang of English tourists invade my bar halfway through the afternoon, all talking very loudly in northern accents, and then trying to impress the waitress with their knowledge of Spanish, which is actually negligible. But I can see how English people get the idea that if they shout loud enough at a foreigner and put an O on the end of every other word, they might be better understood. Spanish really is like that. For example, to recharge your phone, you recargar el móvil. Electrician is electricista. It's like one of those cheat languages that kids make up. Information is information. Policía is police. Tourist office is oficina de turismo. Hotel is hotel. The only difference is the way they pronounce the words and the only reason they all talk like Antonio Banderas is so they can pick up girls on holiday from Walthamstow. My time in Belorado is well spent getting thoroughly drunk. I'm angry at myself, at the world. And this hurts. It sits in the pit of my stomach like a cancer and it bleeds. I make myself everything to a woman, thinking she would need me and never ever leave. She thanked me for loving her and for showing her the way out of the darkness is how I think she put it. Soon she will end it. But why complain? I've been the architect of my own misery. Outrage and disbelief compete. There is no one to blame but myself. I tried to control her, her life and her choices and I've got what I deserved. Then there's my wife. I made myself everything to her. She actually did need me, needed me so much that when I left, life was not worth living to her anymore. It could be said that my insecurities cost my daughters their mother. I buy another drink, and another, until the feelings of grief, abandonment and self-loathing go away, at least for tonight. The next morning I grab my hiking boots, tip the blood out and ditch them in a dump bin. I thank Sylvie for her kindness and promise to stay in touch, a promise that, as it turns out, I actually keep. Then I hobble to the bus station and get the morning bus to Burgos to meet Ellie. I feel strangely guilty. Somewhere out there in the hills, Ellie and Ireland and San Sebastian are still walking. I feel like I'm letting the team down. Odd. It takes me 40 minutes to ride what has taken her and the rest of the Peregrinos two days to walk. (laughs) 